Okay, and then after that, oh gosh. Okay, so here we are to the book that really, not a reading, didn't call it a reading slump, but man, I didn't like it. And that is American Gods by Neil Gaiman. I, I'm gonna do a full review on this book at some point, because I need to, because like I have a lot of things to say about it, but I just don't feel like, I don't think I feel like filming it today. So this wrap up is gonna come up, is gonna go up before the review is up. So quickly, I gave this book two stars. I picked it up because the series is coming out. I've never, the, the television series is coming out. And I wanted to read it before the, the series came out and it sounded interesting. And like Neil Gaiman is kind of a pillar in the fantasy genre. And I haven't really read anything by him. I've read Good Omens, which he co-wrote with Cherry Project, and that's it. And I freaking hated this book. Honestly, uh, I don't have any time for Neil Gaiman going forward. I was talking to a friend about American Gods and he was really curious for me to read Neverwhere so that we could discuss that too. <laughs> so I might at some point trying to make myself read Neverwhere but it's not gonna be anytime soon because that is how much I hated American Gods. Like I hated it so much on so many levels. The only reason I got two stars instead of one star is like there were a couple sections in it that I liked and for the most part the writing, the writing like the actual sentences like he can he can put he can write sentences he can put sentences together in paragraphs that make sense which you know compared to like some of the other things I've read is a point that you have to give a star for because sometimes books get published and you're just like what <laughs> so you know like Sarah Day Moss can't write a sentence can't write a paragraph but you know I, I can't fault Gaiman for at least being able to like put words together that make sense. I just happen to have a problem with that. his characters and his themes, his rampant misogyny that's kind of not talked about like at all. I mean, I tried to do some Googling to see if anyone else had the issues with his this book that I'd had and no one is talking about it. So I don't know if everyone's just like drunk the game in Kool-Aid or what. I don't get it. <laughs> And it really frustrated me. Uh, I was talking to a couple of female friends on my Facebook who both really like this book. And I was just like, but, but guys, guys, really, have you read it with a critical lens? Because it's so anti-women. <laughs> like, it's pervasively both in the content and in the characters, but also like the way Gaiman writes female characters is so offensive. I can't stand it. So anyways, that's all I'm gonna say about that. Uh, there will be a full review at some point. I don't know. So while I was reading American Gods, I kind of had to keep taking breaks. Like I read about the first, cause it's also like 660 pages. I mean, admittedly, I was reading like the author's preferred version, so it's a little bit longer, but still, it's long. So I got through maybe like 250 pages of it, was hating it. So I had to stop and take a break, and I decided to pick up Captive Prince by C.S. Picot. At the time, like I picked this up, I was just going to read like one chapter of it, see how I got on with it, see if it would be a good break from American Gods. Within 24 hours, that book was read. <laughs> so it was a fantastic break from American Gods. And this is the crazy thing, right? So Captive Prince is billed as a male-male romance novel. It is, but it's way more about kingdoms and politics than necessarily the romance. The romance is, is integral to the story. Like, don't get me wrong, the romance is integral, but it's almost secondary to like every all all the rest of the political stuff that's happening and that's why I really loved it because it had like both of those elements and they were just both so strong and really good and really interesting and had fantastic characters but okay so this is a story about two men eventually falling in love and having you know full-on gay sex on the page and yet I felt less like I was being teabagged by a book with literal on the page male male sex than I did by American Gods. Okay, like American Gods is bad. So Captain Prince is the first in the trilogy. I gave it four stars. You definitely have to read the whole trilogy because each book has a has like an arc, uh, an arc and a conflict that's resolved at the end of the book. But the entire character arc is really spans all three books and is not resolved until the end of the third book. So I highly suggest if you're gonna read them, read all three of them. This book takes place in like a fantasy land where there are four fantasy kingdoms. Two of them are primary subjects. So 
in the southernmost kingdom, which is based off of kind of the, the ancient Grecian state. So you have lots of like Greek city states, but once they kind of like joined up together, kind of under Alexander the Great, that's kind of what it's this this kingdom is based off of. It's called like Akalos. I'm probably pronouncing that incorrectly, but yeah, Akalos. And then you have the Northern Kingdom, which felt, I want to say, like early, early medieval France, just based off of some of the names that are used, but I could be totally wrong about that. You have these two kingdoms. Six years prior to the start of the story, uh, the Southern Kingdom invaded the southernmost portion of the Northern Kingdom and took it from them. And the Prince of the Southern Kingdom killed the Prince of the Northern Kingdom. And won the day basically. So in the north you now have a regency and the younger brother, the brother of the prince who was killed, has been growing up until he's old enough to take the throne. So then in the southern kingdom the book starts off with the king of that kingdom dying and then he has two sons. He has his legitimate son who won the day six years ago and he has a bastard son who's not in the line of secession. The bastard son faking his brother's death and then selling his brother into slavery to the Northern Kingdom where his brother ends up being given as like a slave to the prince of the Northern Kingdom. In the Southern Kingdom there is slavery and in the Northern Kingdom so you have to understand that the entire trilogy is basically from the, the point of view of the prince from the Southern Kingdom. So from his perspective there's also slavery in the North. However, the slavery in the North is actually not like the slavery in the South. It's more like indentured servitude, where you have contracts with the people that you're indentured to, like as a body servant, as a sex servant, basically. But it's more of like a financial transaction where they pay you in gems and money and gold and like outfits and all that sort of stuff. And you can actually like pay out your contract with them and like go to someone else for a new contract, that kind of thing. So it's not entirely the same thing. Whereas the, the slavery in the South is definitely based off of like ancient Grecian slavery, ancient Roman slavery. It's very similar to that. Like I said, the whole trilogy is told from the perspective of the prince in the South who has been sold into being a body slash sex slave for the prince in the North. And the prince in the North is one icy bastard, like cold. But it turns out that there's like, there are reasons for that. He is a very, a very reserved young man, but he's also battling with a lot of political forces who want to see him dead and dethroned. And so there are two more books in this trilogy. The second one is Prince's Gambit, which I also read. I gave four and a half stars to. And then there's a third book called King's Rising, which I gave five stars to. Essentially, you know, as you go along in the story, you just peel away one layer of political intrigue to find out that there are 10 more layers underneath. And that's the thing that I really appreciated. It was very hard because you were always in one point of view and a very limited perspective and with a character who had a limited understanding of what was going on and you were learning with him, you could see that there was so much going on, but you, you were just, you could never always, you couldn't always nail down what an action would mean or something someone would say would mean because you needed to like, dig deeper into the layers to find out all the, where all the little pieces were man being maneuvered. It was, it's a very smart, clever book. I freaking love Laurent so much. I picked him up because I, I heard the author talking on a podcast, which I will leave a link to down below. She seemed just like such a fun, interesting, clever writer. And her, she talks about like why she wrote the story, why she made some of the choices she did. She talks about being um, a bisexual woman and she talks about like representation and stuff like that. She also discusses like identifying with queer coded villains as a child, you know, that kind of thing. So I think it's a really interesting podcast, really interesting like conversation and I freaking loved her books. So unapologetically saying that. I, I read the, the Captain Prince trilogy in between reading, finishing up American Gods. I finally finished American Gods felt like I'd been teabagged by that book, just hated it. So after that I decided, you know what, I need some like female writers writing kick-ass female characters. So I picked up the second book in the 20-sided Sorcerer series by Annie Blay, which is called Murder of Crows. I gave this book three stars. It's kind of like a three and a half stars. These books are like popcorn reads. They're pretty short. They're not like 
the deepest thing ever. They really, they really do suffer from not having enough plot just because she likes to write such short books. Her character, her protagonist is a Native American sorceress who's been hiding from another sorcerer, a sorcerer who trained her and helped her when she was very young to grow her powers because he wanted to eat her heart and consume her power. And when she realized that's what he was doing, she ran away from him and she's been in hiding from him for like 25 years. And recently things have started happening that have caused, have forced her to start using her powers again and attract his attention. And the second book, we get to go back to where Jade is from. We get to see the people she grew up with, the tribe that she grew up with. There's a little bit of a murder mystery, which I really wish had been a little bit more fleshed out. But I think Jade is a really solid character. She's not like the most likable person, but she's a real person. And I think she has a really cool take on magic in this. Basically, sorcerers can do almost anything, but they have to be able to contextualize what they want to do and so the way the protagonist in the series contextualizes magic and translates it into something that her human brain can like use is to use D&D &D spells to craft spells <laughs> so like it's not necessary but it just helps her frame her magic into quantifiable units and abilities and I just think that's so clever. It's so it's such a like a geeks book. There's a lot of pop culture references and stuff like that in it. The protagonist actually runs a comic book cards and comics shop and plays D&D &D and all that sort of stuff. It's a fun little romp and it was the perfect thing to pick up. And then the last thing I read this month was Sebriel by Garth Nix. I think I put this on my t most anticipated reads of 2017. I've owned this copy for a number of years. I picked it up secondhand somewhere for probably like 50 cents. It's kind of a classic like early YA fantasy novel that I just never read. I gave this four and a half stars. It's a really you know quick read. I would call this probably like a really really early YA book. Like I would suggest it to kids who are kind of transitioning from middle grade, middle grade to YA just because it's such an easy read. I also think it'd be a really good primer for kids to read who might go on to read high fantasy because it has a lot of elements of the high fantasy genre and the way it's written but it's not as dense as some of those novels and also it's shorter. <laughs> so this book takes place in kind of um, an alternative reality to ours, an alternative England slash Scotland where um, Hadrian's Wall is actually a kind of a magical wall that exists and so in the south in what would be England it's called Elsa Sister I can't I cannot pronounce this word and Sister I, I give up so in the south southern portion there's no magic and then in the north portion which would be like Scotland there it's the old it's called the old kingdom and it's there's tons of magic it, it's very much about the the line between life and death there are things called free magic, which are kind of like elemental beings. And then there's also the dead. And so they are beings, they're people who have died, who have crawled back out of death and refused to die. And they're like magical beings now trying to, to like cling to life. And it follows this gal called Sabriel, who is the daughter of the Aborsen. The Aborsen is pledged to make the dead stay dead, to send the dead back into death, and to help protect the old kingdom. Very early on in the book, her father sends her his his sword and his bandolier of bells, which is the mark of the abortion, um, basically because he has been trapped in death and he's passing on the cloak of their office, essentially. And Sabriel goes into the old kingdom to try to find her father before he is fully dead. She, she doesn't believe that he's actually like dead dead. She thinks she can bring him back safely and she also wants to figure out what happened to him and there's a lot. She basically finds out that there's a lot more going on. She's lived in the south at a boarding school her entire life so she has not spent a considerable amount of time in the old kingdom and it's the, the entire place has really suffered in the last 200 years since kind of the kingdom, the, the reigning family fell. And that's all connected. And she goes on a great little adventure. And 
I quite enjoyed it. I gave, I didn't give it five stars just because I thought the ending was a little bit abrupt. abrupt. I, I think the ending had good symbolism. It wrapped back around to the first prologue chapter. And so it works. I just wanted more. I kind of wanted to see what would happen. Just like a glimpse into her life afterwards. Kind of like how the last chapter in Uprooted gives us a glimpse into after everything that's happened, we get to see Agnieszka a couple months after the big battle. I kind of wanted that in this. So I know that there are more in this series, but I heard that they don't follow the same characters or even like necessarily the same chronological order. I don't know if I'm going to be picking them up anytime soon. I'm glad I've read this. I will definitely be suggesting this to various younger people. I'm probably gonna pass this off to my sister to read just to see if she wants to give it to my nephew because yeah, I think this is a really good transition book from middle grade to YA. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that was really long, but I read a lot of stuff. Most of it was pretty good, but I also had a couple unfortunate real low points. But you know, I'm not gonna complain because the good definitely outweighed the meh. So let me know if you've read any of these books down below, what you thought about them, or if this has inspired you to pick any of them up. And I'll see you guys all in my next video. Bye. Mm -hmm.